Thank you both so much for coming. This is very exciting for me um, and exciting, for, I think, for all of us. So I'd love to just start off with um, kind of how we all got here. And I know that you, we've been talking about the fact that you were in the private sector and you ran manufacturing companies um, and you were doing wire transfers between the US and China and just wondering kind of why this doesn't work. And so I understand the, the digital asset and you know, uh, crypto uh, kind of start, but what about Congress? And then I'd love to hear Ron, Ron uh, Hammond, who worked in Congressman Davids, Davison's office. Love to hear your perspective as well in terms of how you came to public service. Yeah, so um, when I came to Congress, I, I got elected. Speaker Boehner resigned. Uh, I owned manufacturing companies, and then I got in really at the last minute. So that was 2016. Uh, and you know, in this space, 2016 was still pretty early days. And um, so June of 16, I would get there, and you're starting to feel out issue areas and get into committees. So you start understanding how does Congress work. And then I, I work to get onto the Financial Services Committee. So January of 17, I start out in financial services. And if you think about 17, um, in the financial services space, the ICO market was going through a dynamic period. And so a lot of people were talking about it. I mean, yeah. not macro in the country. It had its own niche following. Um, but so I started paying attention to that and I go, well, why is this going on? What's, what's happening? And so we started pushing for hearings. And at that time, Ron was working in our office. And all the hearings were kind of like, well, this is what a blockchain is. Or this is how you buy Bitcoin on a wallet. And, you know, kind of really, really basic stuff. And we could never really get a substantive piece. So fast forward to 2018, we've been at this for a year now. And we just go, you know, we can't get a hearing. I mean, I'm a new member. I'm not a chairman of anything. So maybe we could just, like I could schedule a meeting and book a room. And Ron really organized all that and turned this great uh, event into uh, what has now produced the Token Taxonomy Act. Mm -hmm. And the goal was to get, you know, 15 or 20 innovators in this space in a room and just listen, you know, what's going on? Why is it happening? What does Congress need to do about it? And, and then that got oversubscribed, and maybe that's a good way for Before Ron to Before Ron starts, in. can I just say that that is exactly why everyone in this room hears you and why you resonate? I can't believe that you booked a room in the Library of Congress without kind of the rules around that. I feel like there's a lot of frustration um, about things not getting done. So I just want to thank you for that. Yeah, thanks. So that was like when I first got there, I was, I, you know, I was like early on, people said, well, what's the biggest surprise? And I would say, well, there's no whiteboards. So you go to Congress and like the offices on the Hill are set up mostly like living rooms. You have, you know, office furniture, but it's really kind of like someone's going to bring in tea and biscuits any minute now, right? <laughs> and it's like, no, this is America. Like, where's a conference room table and a whiteboard where we can like brainstorm and collaborate? Yeah. And then you go over to the committees and all these big raised platforms and people are down and you have your camera and mic and people will come and go and record their sessions, but there's not this dialogue afterwards. And I thought, where do we do that? And I thought that was missing. So this was a way to do it the way that I thought we should do a hearing, which was mostly listen to what everybody else has and then have collaboration among colleagues about, so what do we do about it? And, and that session kind of wrapped up with, uh, with, with uh, one, of the, one of the early stage companies saying, it, from listening to everyone, it doesn't sound like this is a partisan issue, it just sounds like people don't understand it. And that's definitely been the case here. It's not necessarily, a, a, certainly not a traditional left-right issue. Yeah. Great. Yeah, we saw that. I mean, when we were uh, organizing the panel, uh, there was Darren Soto, Ted Budd, Tom Emmer, and yourself, um, you know, in bipartisan coalition, uh, you know, Republicans and Democrats, which is really unique. Uh, but the formation of the legislation as well really stemmed from that 2018 uh, September uh, roundtable that was at the Library of Congress. And so, unlike a lot of legislative proposals that are out there, this is something that, you know, the conversation stemmed from that. We, I mean, he wrote down <laughs> just pages and pages of notes. And afterwards, uh, the congressman gave me like 12 pages of notes and said, hey, this is what I got, uh, but talk to everyone else and see what else we missed. And that pretty much kickstarted, which was the Token Taxonomy Act, which came out 
uh, December 21st, I believe, of 2018, and then reintroduced with a couple of edits back in uh, April of 2019 after the SEC guidance came out, uh, which is pretty awesome to see that the collaboration of between industry and um, Congress. But I mean, speaking on, from the inside, I had about 60 pages from industry plus of legal notes. And so I had to sift through all of those folks, uh, legal opinions, uh, you know, run, talk to the regulators, what have you, and see you know, what the final product would be. And so and a lot of that was, you know, a lot of conversation we had, I mean, it took hours and hours and hours to get to that final product. So um, it, was, it was a lot of work, but it was really exciting to kind of be on the ground floor of that movement. Can you just go into more detail in terms of kind of how the committee structure works and how, you know, the token taxonomy will actually become law? And also just Maxine Waters' role in that, you know, in the House Financial Services Committee, for, as an example, kind of, can you just walk us through? Yeah, so, um, you know, committees in Congress, so one, you know, you have the U.S. House of Representatives, there's 435 members, and you, it's broken down into 16 committees. Um, some committees are bigger jurisdictions than others, so there are four what are considered A committees, financial services, energy and commerce, ways and means, uh, which does tax policy primarily, and then, uh, and then appropriations, which spends the money. Uh, and, and so those are the four big committees. So they're hard to get on. People work to get on to them. Uh, and, you know, you work to get on to other committees because it's important to your district or because it's the background you bring to the table. And, uh, and so that kind of brings it together. And they all have jurisdictions. And so part of the thing that people wonder, well, why is this solution like partial, like no one thought through like the whole picture, and part of it goes to the structure of Congress. So like in our committee, for example, um, you know, we have jurisdiction over financial services, and you would think that inherently that would mean we would also have oversight of the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, mm -hmm. right? But in Congress, that's regulated by the House Agriculture Committee which isn't rational, but that's how it is. <laughs> so we can't pass, uh, we, can't, we can't move a bill that inherently deals with CFTC uh, without a waiver from that chairman. And the chairman get territorial to protect their turf, and so it prevents coherent solutions a lot of times. So that's the other thing, when you have uh, just a meeting, well, you can cover the whole range. So uh, the Token Taxonomy Act has one provision that we had to get that just is, is central to solving the problem, which is tax. So we, we need a waiver from um, Ways and Means to be able to get the de minimis uh, exception for currency. And, in, and why did we pick $600? Well, it's not because I want that to be the number, it's because that's currently the law in fiat. So if you were gonna go to Europe and you're in America, you got US dollars, you say, I'm going to London first, so I'm gonna get pounds sterling. And then you say, well, I'm already in London, I still have some pounds and uh, still have some dollars, so I'm gonna convert them into euros and go to fr France. Uh, as long as you don't net out $600, then no one does it. No one really even tracks it, right? Mm -hmm. But if you start doing Forex and you have more than $600, well then you have to deal with capital gains and you have to develop a way to recognize um, where you're at in that. So this is one of the central issues in crypto. And so we need that waiver to move through it. But then you say, okay, this is the drafting of the bill and how you have jurisdiction. How, once you've got a bill, and we get this question on Twitter a lot, you know, what's happening with the bill? And um, you, you need to move from uh, a hearing about the bill. So it'll be noticed for a hearing. And we'll have that as part of the subject for one of the hearings so that all members officially are on notice that, hey, we might as a committee start to move this bill. So if you want to amend it or you got questions about how this bill would affect it, that's the kind of witnesses you want to call and the kind of questions you want to ask uh, so that you can start working together behind the scenes, not in a productive meeting space, um, or to prepare amendments to the bill to say, hey, I'm going to plan to offer an amendment at markup. So then you get notice to say, overwhelmingly, we like the bill you'll go into a markup, and that's where amendments are offered inside our committee. Okay. And, you know, vote yes or no. A lot of those, frankly, turn into party line pieces where if the, you know, the chairwoman, in this case, Maxine Waters, says we're gonna support it, then virtually everyone on the Democratic side will vote for it. 
And if ranking member Patrick McHenry um, says we're not going to support it, then virtually everyone will vote against it. And mm -hmm. it's not a 100% lockstep, but a lot of that turns into like a team sport exercise. So that's why it's really important to get the support of the leadership of um, your committee on board. And in, literally it's vital because if you want it to move to uh, a noticed bill, it's got to be the support of the subcommittee chair, in this case, Carolyn Maloney, mm -hmm. or the FinTech Task Force, Stephen Lynch. So Carolyn Maloney's from New York, Stephen Lynch from Massachusetts, invite them to everything in the space. Mm -hmm. uh, so they learn about it, know about it, and then ask, hey, when is this going to be scheduled for a hearing? And then to go to markup, that's where Maxine Waters, even if the chair likes it, unless she gets on board with it, it's not going to be there. Fundamentally, if she's not somewhat supportive, it won't even be noticed for the hearings, okay. uh, particularly with the way Maxine's involved with the subcommittees. Mm -hmm. But let's say it passes markup and we, we vote. And it's just overwhelmingly supportive. Mm -hmm. Everyone says this is the greatest idea ever. Um, it's non-controversial, non-partisan. Sometimes those go on suspension votes and they'll just get voted on without a big debate on the floor. Some of them even will go by voice, although that decreases the chances they get taken up by the Senate. Mm. This is in the weeds. So, so then uh, let's say that you have a real debate and it passed, but it was like 70-30, most people support it. Some people like Brad Sherman are opposed. We know he'll be no, a no. Um, and you have the debate on the floor, it, it, it's voted on and it passes overwhelmingly, then you start pushing for a vote in the Senate. And then you gotta get Steven Mnuchin and Donald Trump to be supportive of it, and then they put it on there. So it's uh, you know in-depth version of how a bill becomes a law. It, to build on that actually, you know, at least from you know, the outside perspective here, I mean, that's the inside baseball, I mean, how complicated it is really to get a piece of legislation through, no matter how big or small. I mean, it really does take all these moving pieces. Um, and it's a joint effort. So, uh, so in my new capacity here with Ripple, uh, I'll be working more on the, uh, the outside here, scheduling meetings with a lot of those influential folks on those uh, powerful committees that the Congressman was just talking about, you know, Senate banking, House Financial Services. Um, and as you know, you know, with a Democrat House and a Republican Senate, it's really vital to make sure that this maintains its nonpartisan or bipartisan um, support uh, for this issue. And so, uh, you know, even in the two months I've been uh, with Ripple, I've you know, been meeting with a lot of folks from you know, both sides of the aisle uh, in both the House and the Senate. And the idea is you know, shaping the narrative for hearings or whether it be for uh, input on legislation. Um, and so at least within you know, my new capacity, it's been really exciting to engage in those folks um, and be really, really active and focusing solely on stuff like the Token Taxonomy Act to making sure we can get that legislation through in some form or fashion, whether it be you know, again through the standalone, through an amendment, um, through uh, you know one form or another, um, and you know before I came to Ripple, you know the best example of the outside groups really having an impact is with the Blockchain Association. Um, in late July, there was a hearing at the Senate Banking Committee on crypto regulation as a whole, and they were able to they being the Blockchain Association, Kristen Smith's been really good over there. They were able to get a witness actually on that panel, uh, Jeremy Allaire, the CEO of Circle. And so that kind of shows like that government relations role, what exactly do we do on the outside here in DC? It's stuff like that. We get folks uh, on panels on, you know, uh, at hearings. We shape the narratives for hearings uh, as a whole, that, which eventually shape legislation uh, and move legislation. And so it's been really exciting to kind of see that on a different side. Um, but you know, that inside baseball knowledge is really, really crucial to advance legislation. It's, it's difficult. Great. So we have to go to Libra, of course, in this session. Uh, so there was a really interesting uh, economist from the Fed who recently uh, discussed this idea that Libra is n really only a threat to payment processors, not to central banks. And he actually said that, you know, at the Federal Reserve, there's, you know, a lot of discussion as to whether or not Bitcoin would actually be something more suitable to a Federal Reserve, you know, central you know, currency. So I wondered, and, and I listened to your podcast, and I'm sure a lot of people here have as well, and you also alluded to this, and I'd love for you to distinguish, um, again, for all of us, kind of how you think about Libra versus how you think about Bitcoin. Well, let me tell you about Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> now, that was, what, that was what the hearing was when Mark Zuckerberg came. It was all about Mark Zuckerberg or Facebook or yep. every grievance anybody had with online anything. Uh, so thankfully, um, some of my colleagues spent time talking about blockchain, and some of them even talked about Libra and Calibra. 
Um, so Libra being their proposed um, digital currency of sorts, and, uh, and then Calibra being their proposed um, digital wallet. And so, you know, when I think about the, the idea of Libra, the first thing goes to, you know, the, the conversation that I had in a hearing uh, with our a previous panel here, you know, what is, uh, what, is, what is the biggest difference between Bitcoin and shitcoin? And some people say every altcoin is, uh, you know, uh, falls short. But the, the difference I try to draw is centralized versus decentralized. And when you look at, you know, uh, when I did talk to Mark Zuckerberg, I, he seemed like he might be having the kind of day where he envied whomever Satoshi Nakamoto is, right? <laughs> like, can't subpoena Satoshi Nakamoto. We can't have Satoshi come up here and get ripped by members of Congress for everything that people don't like about. Um, and it's, you know, there's no headquarters for it, right? So it's as decentralized as you could think of uh, versus Libra would literally have a headquarters in Geneva. And that headquarters entity, though it's uh, proposed as a nonprofit, would actually be able to change the value of it. So the value of your token depends on how well they do their job. Um, and so it's proposed as a synthetic currency. This is, goes back all the way to Keynes, probably further, uh, you know, in terms of monetary policy ideas. And for some people, it has an appeal because it's a, a built-in currency hedge. Uh, and then beyond the basket of currencies, it would, the proposal is that it would trade short-term securities. And that inherently in the U.S., if it's backed by securities, would mean that it would be regulated by uh, the SEC, it would be a security in the United States in current law. Mm -hmm. um, but then when you go to our proposed language in the Token Taxonomy Act, the other piece that might make it not clear that the SEC isn't, doesn't have a role is the idea that the central authority stays in control of it and, uh, and you can't necessarily do, the, do anything with those tokens without some third party or an immediate intermediary. And so the, the question then is kind of back to the other panel, can anyone create a wallet? Only certain people, or are there gonna be other wallets besides Calibra? And then what's the criteria for being able to create a wallet? And if it's not truly decentralized, uh, where people can do that, then it wouldn't inherently not be a security under the Token Taxonomy Act. Mm -hmm. You know, also I think whatever anyone's view is on Libra, the fact of the matter is, at least in DC, it has accelerated the conversation for crypto uh, and crypto regulation and blockchain as a whole, which is really exciting because you know, it's really been cool to see that this comes to the forefront of a lot of committees. Um, I mean, the concerns are warranted, um, but my major concern is the lack of education leads to bad legislation. Uh, I mean, the Token Taxonomy Act took nearly two years to craft. Uh, but now in wake of Libra and in the wake of a lack of uh, proper education from the industry, um, we've seen bills like uh, Stable Coins or Securities uh, Act as well as Keep Big Tech Out of Finance because um, these are concerns that these members, they're coming from a good place. They have, right, they have their rightful concerns about Libra, um, but the legislation is rushed. And in that case, you know, we don't want to pass bad legislation. We want to make sure the members of Congress are fully educated so that they can pass well thought out legislation, like the Token Taxonomy Act. I'm not saying it has to take two years worth of, of, of crafting, but we want to make sure that everyone is knowledgeable so they know the ramifications of passing bills such as these, um, and so they aren't more of a, a reaction to Libra. These are more of just a, a well thought out, well, again, how do you properly ensure that we can protect consumers at the same time promote innovation? Because now this can, you know, unfortunately lead to potentially a partisan issue down the road. And we want to make sure we can avoid that given the bifurcation of the, the House and the Senate uh, with who's in control. Mm -hmm. what, yeah. do you, what do you think Bitcoin's role um, would be if in an in a ideal world, I guess? Because there's, there's a couple of issues here. One is Bitcoin is truly decentralized. Um, and then another issue is like just we should take Facebook out of this, I think, because I think that Muddy's Water, look at Square, has done a lot mm -hmm. of things and introduced products, and they're not, there are no hearings yeah. here. Um, so I'd just love for you to dig into that and give our thoughts. Yeah, I think if Facebook just proposed Calibra and they were going to do a digital wallet and settle in other currencies, which is something I also mentioned when I did the Noted podcast, and you know, to your point with the, the Fed's angle. You know, I don't think it would have drawn the same level of scrutiny if they were just going to use a digital wallet to store it. I mean, it, 
in, in a way, it's, a, it's somewhat different what Apple Pay is trying to do, but these are more incremental uh, changes versus trying to launch your own currency. And particularly the idea of a synthetic currency inherently involves people thinking of monetary policy. And I think, you know, while I am appreciative of the dialogue, and I think it's been great overall for the industry, because um, there are people that were like, oh, you know, this is a niche thing, and why is this going to really matter? But when a company with the size and credibility of Facebook starts to move into that space, you're like, oh, well, this, this is going to be a thing. Mm -hmm. And I think that's true for, you know, people in Ohio that, um, you know, it's kind of like, oh, what's the internet? You know, in the early days, now they're like, what's blockchain? Why? Wow, okay, this might be a bigger thing than I thought it was. Mm -hmm. The downside is because Libra was proposed as a currency, it gets to the heart of why we chose to call the bill the Token Taxonomy Act. Taxonomy and language, language matters. We try to refer to them as digital assets or digital tokens because not everything aspires to be even a, even a settlement system. You know, we're talking about uh, projects that move title or deed to land or cars or, um, you know, licensing for software, uh, conveyance of a good or a service. There are all kinds of uses for tokens, and some of those tokens, uh, you know, people will draw their own conclusion about, um, frankly, have great value. And they're going to be structured properly, uh, in my view, where you, you have a good actor or you have a decentralized system with a well thought out, secure way uh, to transact in a clear communication of what's being offered. Uh, right now, securities law is kind of preventing that, and that's what we're trying to get at with the piece. So to the big picture, you know, everyone thinks about blockchain. Their first thought is, is uh, currently, you know, Bitcoin. And, you know, for me, I hope that we make, uh, you know, there's a great banner out there, whoever created it, that, that privacy is not secrecy. And a lot of my colleagues in Congress are afraid that the U.S. is system mm -hmm. of being able to, frankly, spy on all of us with our financial transactions is going to somehow make America less secure, that we're not going to be able to protect the country from terrorists or, uh, you know, human traffickers or drug traffickers or, you know, tax evaders, money launderers, all these things. And, and you know, the Constitution protects a right to privacy. Uh, it doesn't say if you have nothing to fear, you have nothing to hide. It says, you, you know, you have a fundamental right to privacy. And I think Bitcoin gets that right because it's a public, uh, it's a public ledger uh, with private keys. There's a way to discover it, but then there's a certain level of privacy that's involved. So I hope that we get the regulatory framework uh, so good in the United States that someday, whomever Satoshi Nakamoto is or are, um, that uh, we can bring them forward and present them with a congressional gold medal and thank them for this great innovation. Mm -hmm. That's great. I hear somebody clap. I like that. Um, <clears throat> so I'd love to talk a little bit about politics in this country with both of you. Um, there are so many things that you said just now even that really resonate in this, in this uh, community. Um, and even things out, outside of cryptocurrency that you've said about, you know, freedom and um, privacy, transparency, uh, patriotism, and then there are other things within the, you know, it's, it's kind of like there's this, there's this Republican Party and this Democratic Party, and I think a lot of people in our world, and even in technology in general, don't really know where they fit in. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you had a lot of bipartisan support. You had, Tulsi Gabbard and Darren Soto and, you know, God time. You had a lot of, uh, you know, bipartisan support here. Um, and you have a lot of views that I think a lot of people share. But then we have a president who's like, just turn on the printing presses and we're good. And, you know, pushing for more QE, even though mortgage rates are going up when we cut, you know, cut the rates yesterday. So how do those fit? And what party are we in? Like how, or are, is this Republican versus Democrat kind of a thing of the past? Because I, I think the party, I think the parties are in real trouble personally. And I mean, I think you look at the, the participation while it's up, it's up partially because there's so much passion over things that people don't like or fear over things that are proposed. It's not because it's truly resonating with a broad swath of the country. And, you know, like, so in my own campaign, you know, initially I, you know, I coined the phrase, you know, I, no one knew who I was. I was a business guy, pretty private person. 
And I said, you know, I, I'm Warren Davidson. I love this country with a soldier's passion. Mm -hmm. And, you know, whatever followed after that. And th th I think that resonated because people understand in our country right now, um, you know, we are the world's land of opportunity because people, at least in the, since, the, since the Vietnam era, have been part of an all-volunteer force. They do it be, not because they're compelled to or conscripted, yeah. but because they believe in the place and they're really willing to go and do whatever it takes to keep our country that great land of opportunity. And, and I think that resonates broadly with people. When you get down into a number of issues and, it, and the left-right paradigm is just inadequate. It's a two-dimensional um, description of a 3D thing. And when you think about it, Pairwise comparison is one of the easiest games to rig, right? So if you go to game theory, like that's the easiest way to lead somebody down with these syllogisms and pairwise. And that's why they love the system. It's a two-party, two-way, easy way to rig system. And the reality is even if you just go to a, another dimension, you go authoritarian and libertarian, the concern around the world is authoritarians have grown popular. And, and frankly, a lot of people think, oh, well, that's Donald Trump. Well, um, the previous president boasted of governing with a cell phone and a pen. Uh, no one called him an authoritarian, but he literally had no intent to work with Congress. He had court decisions, actually more court decisions, that struck down executive action, like you know, some of them were environmental regulations that a lot of people support, but they didn't move it through law. It was just executive action. Yeah. And so um, I think the libertarian side, like you know, if you look, like Tulsi Gabbard is a co-sponsor on this bill, she and I would agree on a huge range of issues around civil liberties, privacy protections, when and where and why America would go to war, both veterans. Um, but then we, we part ways on a number of other issues and that's why she's in the Democratic Party and I'm in the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. And I think we'll maybe move to a system that's more descriptive of that, but that's kind of where the parties are evolving. Makes sense. Um, <laughs> it's not much you of my, have to answer, my yeah. space there, so, um, <laughs> but, um, I mean, at least, you know, again, back to your more previous point is, you know, at least for the Bitcoin question is, we need a regulatory framework in place first, then yeah. this is a huge thing, and this is a nonpartisan issue. Um, there's a lot of 2020 candidates actually on the legislature who support the Token Taxonomy Act, like Andrew Yang, um, Eric Swalwell, who's now out, and then Tulsi Gabbard and stuff like that, so it's exciting to see that this has risen to the attention of the president as well in his tweets. Um, and again, it's an education thing. We're working on it, um, and I'm really excited the DC office in Ripple now is going to be engaging with regulators as well as um, Capitol Hill. And so we look forward to the challenge. It's a lot, as you heard from the congressman, it's a lot of inside baseball. Um, I wouldn't mind an executive action when it comes to the Token Taxonomy Act, I'll tell you that. Um, but We're certainly rooting for the IRS, because right now the IRS is in the process of some guidance. And uh, I wish we'd move our legislation a little faster. <laughs> Tell me. So it's always exciting. Well, hopefully we'll get there. One last fun question. Do you think Tulsi Gabbard will run? She's already running. Do you think she'll run as an independent? I, you don't think she's going to win the Democratic primary? <laughs> no, I mean, I, 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 don't, I don't think she probably will, but she's qualified for the debate stage. She's built some good momentum. Uh, she's a clear contrast to a lot of candidates in the race. Mm -hmm. um, you know. I'm obviously not going to vote for a Democrat uh, or endorse one, but I will say she's, uh, she's an incredibly good person. I think she's running a, a very effective campaign from where she's forced to run, and uh, I look forward to seeing what she does do. Great. Thank yeah. you both so much. Thanks. Appreciate it.